I would set up my clinic differently. So ideally, I want to have like the bottom floor of my clinic to be a restaurant where I get to Ooh. cook lots of cool foods. And you bring people in um, and they go up to the second floor and they see you and whatever. You like recommend things, right? And you do your that thing. That sounds fun. And All then right. this, <laughs> we're going to get some VCs back this up. Yeah, lure them in with yeah. the food. Yeah. I don't feel like this has to be a, a regret. This could be like a right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So just building that so they like see, okay, everything we talked about is like here and you can see the food, you can see the garden, you can like experience experience what it what we're talking about in the, the appointment you know it's not unattainable so and then you write someone a prescription and they go downstairs and fill it yeah your food podcasting from somewhere with protein shakes and no yearly membership fees this is the hero fit podcast the show that talks about the ins and outs of fitness, nutrition, and anything else that might get you feeling like a hero. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your hosts, Nick Stutzman and Dan Weber. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Hero Fit Podcast, where we love to explore ideas in fitness and nutrition to help you, the listener, with your health. I am Dan Weber with my co-host, Nick Stutzman, and today we are joined by Dr. Tamara Kung. She is a doctor of naturopathic medicine and a nutrition specialist in Toronto. She's also certified in cupping and acupuncture. Dr. Kung owns her own practice, is a contributing writer for wholeandholistic.com, and is also starting a project called Urban Forager, for which you can find information on her website, tamarakung.com. She treats people of all walks of life using nutrition to optimize health and to treat or prevent disease. Today, we're going to talk to her about her treatment approach, her nutritional philosophy, owning a business, cooking, wanting to be a kite surfer, and much more. Tamara, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you both for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show and uh, to share some insights with you and learn a lot from you too as well. Happy to have you. Yeah, nutrition is definitely one of the hot topics for our podcast, and so mm -hmm. we're definitely happy to have a full-blooded uh, nutritionist on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... Uh, we get a lot of interaction from our listeners and uh, they've been demanding more nutrition content lately so yeah yeah well we I love food um, I spend if I could like all day in the kitchen cooking and one of my favorite pastimes is cooking for my friends um, so we mostly have a lot of dinner parties at our place and I'm just experimenting um, getting my friends to cook with me in the kitchen and it's honestly like a happy place for me how how decorated is your kitchen? <laughs> Depends what you mean by decoration. <laughs> I feel like it's, to me, it's probably like one of those Rachel Ray type uh, <laughs> kitchens. That's the know? dream, um, yeah. working towards that. But um, it's pretty simple. It's like a, a standard size kitchen in our apartment. Um, we've got like all the utensils, pots and pans, but, you know, you make a lot of things happen in a little space. So it doesn't need to be elaborate, which is one of the things I really want to emphasize um, for my patients and people I talk to. It's, you know, cooking and making food is not um, an unattainable thing. It doesn't need to be set up like a Rachel Ray or like some beautiful cooking kitchen and you know it's really just like throwing a few things together and learning how to use your senses um and make things that taste good to you so and how long have you been uh cooking meals for your friends Hmm. probably started in high school um i i grew up cooking a lot of my food for my brother and i we used to like come home from high school like make some food and then go play video games or something like that after um but in high school and a bit in university i started learning a lot more about food and where food came from and then i started being interested in more in diets and different nutrition styles um so then i didn't want to eat out as much as i i used to so i wanted to make more of my food at home and so so I'd use my friends as guinea pigs and uh, you know I used to make like weird banana breads with like carrots and pumpkins and stuff like that and uh, they were you know good friends because they stuck by me even till today <laughs> <laughs> they still remind me like my dad reminds me of some pancakes I made him before with almond flour and he was like those are really not good um, 
but he's you know still comes over and <laughs> he's been brave enough to try my new recipes and and they're getting better for him so <laughs> you have to appreciate the honesty though because mm-hmm. then you know when he compliments you that it's legit yeah it's like, honest for sure <laughs> it's yeah and it helps you become better like otherwise you just be making like garbage tasting everyone's <laughs> just smiling and forcing yeah. it down <laughs> like why are my friends not calling me anymore <laughs> <laughs> why don't they want to eat with me yeah. <laughs> my meals yeah so would you yeah. say that that's where you found your passion when you were younger? Just kind of, you know, playing, experimenting playing around in the kitchen? Yeah. Um, actually, when I started experimenting more with like plant-based foods is when I really started like digging deep and um, using different ingredients in different ways I thought was so fun and creative. Like I love to paint. I love to do like other artistic things. And I think cooking is one of the things that was just really like – you know, let, let me get into like a meditative zone and I just got to enjoy the time and the space. Um, yeah, and just kind of just build something from my senses. Mm-hmm. That's the, I think that's one of the fun things about plants is that, mm-hmm. you know, they all have different flavor profiles and you yeah. can have fun trying to mix and match them, yeah, right? Yeah, different textures that you wouldn't have thought and things like that. So like cauliflower is a great one. It's very diverse and even different nuts and things like that too, so... I just tried some cauliflower gnocchi from Trader Joe's. How was that? Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I tried to do the pan saute, I think it was. Mm-hmm. So I, I just, it, they ended up coming out a little bit soggier than I wish. Mm. But uh, it was the first time. So, you know, it's not always going to be perfect the first time. But overall, they're not bad. They, they taste decent. But I yeah. wish they were just that had a little bit more crispiness to them right. from the saute, you know, doing it that way. Yeah, so maybe just at a higher heat with like a little bit of more oil. Like yeah, I think I had enough oil. Now. It was definitely yeah. the heat. The heat was the issue. Okay. I, needed, I needed to heat them up more. And that's the cool thing. Like you learn as you go and mm-hmm. things get better and better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good old cauliflower. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit more about when you were young, your interests uh, growing up in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, how did how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, Um. So the path towards naturopathic medicine was um, an unintended path, I would say. I didn't even know this field existed uh, growing up. And I I wanted to become, like, a doctor. I remember when I was little, we had a little doctor's kit, like Fisher Price or something. And mm-hmm. um, one time, I think my dad got cut, and I pulled open my kit, and I, like, found a band-aid and I put it on him. I'm like, ah, oh, that feels so good to help somebody. <laughs> and I know it's a little cliche, but... I just wanted to help people like with their health and their body because you know when you're you feel good you get to play like my dad can come play with me again and like do stuff so um, that was what I really wanted to do so in university I was studying and getting ready for med school Um, and then I took an alternative course on alternative medicine uh, and I learned about different other modalities and therapies and naturopathic medicine came up in the course like what is this thing and we studied it I I read more into it and you know I was like wow the principles of naturopathic medicine the idea of spending a lot of time with your patient to get to know them on an individual level is like that's what I I always dreamed of and um yeah I think just in the medical system it's really great for certain things and for acute care and things like that. But I, I wanted to be able to not just see my patients as numbers or charts and really build a relationship and know other, like, deeper facts about you um, because that really makes the treatment so much more adherent and effective because we are able to make sure it's sustainable. Like, I'm always asking my patients, I'm going to suggest this for you. Do you think you can implement that in your life? Yes or no? And if so, like, how? You know, how are you going to see that and, you know, stick into your life? Because whatever you give the person, if they're not going to do it, it's not going to help you. You're not helping them with anything. So it's the consistency and matching it with their lifestyle, which is key. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I really gravitated towards naturopathic medicine, um, especially after like, going to a lot of doctor's appointments with my grandfather, who I was really close with. Um, yeah, he had a farm and we grew up with him there and we loved um you know like growing like eating vegetables from his farm and picking like strawberries in the store um and he really taught me a lot of things about like how to grow things and just sitting with him in the yard just talking about his life and hearing his story um you know him and I were really close together and 
um, over time he got a little more sick and he had a few cardiovascular issues and um, so I started going with him to some of his doctor's appointments just to help translate uh, for him and like we went to his cardiologist one time and you know he the, we were waiting for the doctor and he just walked in the door and like didn't look at my grandfather just sat in his chair and like just read off the chart and mm -hmm. it said like my your heart and just trailed off and my grandfather's like what's going on he's confused he's like he uh, doesn't understand like what's happening and why they're giving him certain things and and then they just write a prescription and that's that's the encounter and in my head I'm like there's so much more that I feel like could be so helpful for the patient um one like you're there in a like a scary environment in the first place. So I want to make sure they feel one comfortable and two, I want them to be informed um, so they know what's happening and taking off some of that confusion and the worry. Um, and that's just like the worst case scenario. I think like a lot of MDs and um, medical doctors are like super competent and I work with a few who are amazing um, at my integrated clinic and they, they really see the, you know, whole person. They have a good relationship. Um, but yeah, that was just kind of my experience. And I'm like, hey, I don't want to go into medicine anymore. I want to do naturopathic medicine. Um, and so that's kind of what kind of directed me towards that. So, All right. Mm -hmm. Two things so, off that. One, I'm, I'm glad the game of operation didn't motivate you. Into, <laughs> <laughs> instead, it was just a toy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Secondly, to, to kind of divert just one second away from that, but mm -hmm. what you're talking about with doctors and Hidden Brain had a podcast about that this week where they were talking about how more minority doctors um, tend to be more inclined to be um, to care about their patients, mm -hmm. make notes about what they have and what they do. And so it's kind of cool that you notice that yourself, you know, being more involved with your patients and, and trying to find like an efficiency in, the, in that sense, kind of circling back, which is what you were talking about, where is this something that if we implement, you'll actually be able to follow and stuff like that? Because I think that that can go a long way mm -hmm. into not only treating, but, you know, giving them the confidence that they need to say that, okay, well, I can succeed in doing this as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think another part of naturopathic medicine is education for the patient. And I spend a lot of my time just teaching people about what's going on in their body um, and helping them understand why certain symptoms are you know, coming up and expressing themselves. So with that, I want the patients to have tools to navigate their life outside of the clinic because healing doesn't happen in the clinic. It happens outside with their work. And so giving them the knowledge so that every choice that they make outside is, you know, going to add to their health, is going to contribute and benefit their health. Um, because honestly, there's a lot of health information out there. It can get a little confusing. It can contradict each other. So when you're looking it up yourself, you're like, oh my goodness, there's so Web many MD's things. WebMD always telling you you have cancer. <laughs> right. Cancer or maybe just a mole. Like I don't have, <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. Like, Herpes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's just, it can be so overwhelming for people. So I think if you're armed with knowledge about what's going on in your body and why, it can help you feel more confident in your decisions out in life. And that's where the sustainable part of your health from. Conversely with that, do you feel like then that means that you're limited by how many patients you can see because you're trying to be so involved in, in trying to help them or is it kind of you're able to, you know, you got a good system going where you can take on a, a, a good heap of, of, of amount of, of patients? You can still take on quite a bit, but the time of our appointments are a lot longer than conventional ones. So my initial appointments are about an hour long and that's, you know, lots of questions mm -hmm. and understanding every detail about that person. And then health history and lifestyle, lifestyle, stresses, relationships, sleep habits, like mm -hmm. when you wake up, how many times do you wake up in the night? What time do you wake up? What's your energy like? Um, we talk about poo a lot and some can go in depth about that. And cause, nice. um, there's so much information to gather from everything that your body's doing. Every symptom you're experiencing is a data point for us to understand what's going on. So it's so important to get like a really good comprehensive view of the patient. And that takes time. Um, so limited in a sense where we can only see, you know, maybe eight or 10 patients in a day. Um, 
but yeah definitely you know you can there's a lot of people looking for this kind of care as well and there's a lot more naturopaths coming uh, to the scene so um, definitely accessible so nutrition for you what is nutrition for you like how do you define it Mm. I like to look at nutrition not in terms of nutrition per se like I like to step back and look at a food so I'm not so much into oh eat certain things just because it has a certain mineral or vitamin um of course like there's you know certain therapeutic effects and well like you know incorporate more of these seeds like pumpkin seeds because it'll help with some acne for example because of the zinc but it's all got a lot of fibers it's like a whole package of nutrients inside um that just works Mm -hmm. synergistically together so just talking about a nutrient on its own um i think it it removes people from understanding food because you can't see a vitamin, you can't see a mineral. That relationship kind of gets faded if you're just only thinking about food in that term. So I want people, I want to invite people back into thinking about whole foods again. Um, nutrition, I would say, is just a whole food diet, eating things that your great grandmother would recognize as a, a real food. Um, you know, when you have ingredients, like, can you picture each ingredient on the label that you're reading? You know, do, what the original source looks like. If, if so, then that's a, a real food. Um, so there's a few different, like, guidelines I use for my patients to understand, I guess, nutrition in that sense, um, in that perspective. I think it's a little... A little more um, fun and it's a little more helpful I think for the patients so they don't get so lost in certain fads of one nutrient and we have one of your guides right here in front of us uh, so this is pretty pretty useful so you created your own uh, pamphlet for for uh, patients clients what do you call them yeah, but for my patients, um, patients, when I do talks at different companies, uh, employees, members, for you guys, like honestly, whoever can get their hand on it, I, I want you to look at it. Take your time to see. Is what, this on your website? Um, not yet, okay. but it will be. Um, I'm right. just distributing it right now in different parts of the city. But um, <laughs> my brother, <laughs> yeah, um, my brother makes my website, so he's, um, you know, he's working in Taiwan, so he's taking some time to like build this for me so i really appreciate he's on a different time zone he's in a different time zone (laughs) but i really appreciate his help it's great to have someone to do this for you so but yeah this is a nice guide that somebody can have they can further understand what you're saying and Mm -hmm. use it to help them uh you know make decisions when they're at the grocery store and and whatnot and it's called the urban forager Mm -hmm. and yeah it has definitely some neat little tips here we'll we'll obviously we'll show it off for you Mm -hmm. uh on the site Mm mm-hmm Circling it back a little bit, so I want you to, I don't, maybe you've already answered this, but better define the difference between naturopathic and what conventional medicine um, is, like maybe what the education and philosophy, mm-hmm. how they differ. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, so the education uh, for naturopathic medicine is similar in that the first, like about half of it is all biology physiology we're learning the same you know human anatomy Um, but where our paths diverge is that instead of learning all the pharmaceuticals we still learn pharmaceuticals but um, Mm -hmm. we don't learn to prescribe them necessarily Mm -hmm. Um, we learn about all the natural modalities so we've got traditional Chinese medicine which is your acupuncture cupping Uh, we have a lot of herbal medicines so we use like plants in tincture forms or in teas and then we learn about different supplements and vitamins, um, different, uh, you know, supplements you can take to help with any deficiencies that you may have. Um, and then there's like lifestyle counseling and learning how to talk to people in a way that helps them open up about different areas of their life that they're not used to sharing, perhaps, mm-hmm. but it can contribute to um, success in their treatment. Um, so that's kind of where we differ in that sense. Our modalities, our toolkit is a little bit different. Um, but we are trained in pharmaceuticals for the safety aspect because we want to make sure that the things we prescribe don't interact with um, medication because some yeah. herbs, for example, will interact with the uh, drugs. So we ha- we're always checking to make sure that what we do complement what the doctor, uh, medical doctors are prescribing their patients. Um, so it's a really nice... I think a really nice 
to bring different healthcare providers who are experts in different areas together. And I'm so happy to be working in an integrated clinic at Cadence because of that. Um, if I ever have any questions about the effects of a certain pharmaceutical, I can just pop over and ask um, the doctors or vice versa. They can ask me about a different condition that they're not seeing an effect with and they're wondering why. We have to dig a little deeper. So it really gives, you know, if your patient's able to access multiple healthcare providers, MDs, NDs, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that give you a more comprehensive and holistic look at your health. And you've got a, like an army, like a team of healthcare providers on your side mm -hmm. working together, um, which is really so awesome. One of our guests says that. You get, get a team of uh, <laughs> professionals behind you. Yeah, yeah, teamwork makes the dream work. So You said it, Nick. <laughs> um, so uh, what prompts somebody to seek out a naturopathic doctor typically? Typically, it's um, when they aren't seeing the desired effects of the traditional medicine, the conventional medicine. Um, if, for example, they get recurrent UTIs or things like that, and they're just like wondering, like, I'm so tired of dealing this. I don't want to mm -hmm. take antibiotics forever every time this happens. Like, there has to be another way. Like, they, I get a lot of, you know, young professionals who are, you know, really well educated and are starting to ask deeper questions like, why am I getting this? You know, instead of just letting, you know, the prescriptions come in or, you know, being told what to do, they want to be more proactive. So I'm seeing a lot more of those kinds of patients who want to take control and, you know, be more preventative in their lifestyle uh, for health. So it's people who are more curious who want to know why. And um, yeah have like health in their own hands as well do you see a lot of people who are into fitness mm -hmm. especially for for their, what might be ailing them yeah yeah so i have a few athletes who are training for marathons and things like that and they just want to optimize the nutrition um and also like you know nutrition before events and things like that um, also for any you know muscle fatigue or aches we do some treatment for like cupping and acupuncture for those as well Mm -hmm. And I also get a lot of um, people who are, you know, working and they want to optimize their brain function. So they're looking for uh, certain herbs or things that will help with their memory, help with their focus. And, of course, um, sleep is a big one, too. So, um, yeah, that's it. She just said all three for you. In a city, in a city like this, uh, I imagine that's a big deal, having to be optimally performing and on possibly less sleep than what would what yeah. you'd like <laughs> and um you know that's i'm glad we're kind of segueing i'm going to bring the segue into sleep anyways um because we are used to being told like okay sleep is for the week like i'll sleep when i'm dead because there's honestly infinite things that we can do nowadays and we constantly kind of pile on our plates oh i can do this or like there's another opportunity and i find a lot of people like yourself are just bringing on too much and they're not prioritizing sleep anymore because you know, sleep kind of seems like a lazy thing to do, to be honest. It's you're just lying there um, and you're not being productive with your time. So I think a lot of people are having a hard time seeing um, or letting go of some of the things to prioritize sleep. Um, but sleep is huge. Sleep is huge for your productivity and for health benefits. I'm sure you guys know. Yeah, I've, we can go back to the European model of <laughs> sleep where you can nap during the day. Mm -hmm. That's that'd be my life. <laughs> You know, siesta yeah, yeah get some siestas going <laughs> we'll wake you up when the, we're done okay yeah, under the tuscan sun i'll be fine <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah um but i've yeah also been doing a lot more like research into types of sleep and and why so they said the first half of our sleep is uh, where we have our stage three non-rem sleep and that's our called deep sleep and that's when our body has the cellular repair. And that's the only time where our body starts to, you know, build things to help us feel refreshed in the morning. And if we're not getting that, then people are, you know, not going to have the muscle repair or just like clearing things out that's happened throughout the day. And they're waking up tired and exhausted in the morning. And so that happens only in the first half of the night. So between 10 and 2 a.m. So people who are pushing their sleep 
further and further back, maybe not going to bed till 12 or 1, they're completely missing the window for deep sleep because that cycle shortens over the rest of the night and sometimes even disappears in the second half of our sleep. Um, so it's, you know, sleep can become very not restorative for people. And I hear that a lot in my, in my practice where people are saying like, I'm sleeping these hours, but I feel like a bag of potatoes in the morning and I just can't move or, you know, they're just so exhausted and burnt out and you're, you know, you're, they're missing that whole window. How do you, how do you track stuff like that? So there are apps um, that you can use. And I think on your like smartphones and stuff like that, you can find <laughs> in your watch as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how, how can, how consistent are those, I guess? How, um, how, I mean, do you feel like that they're, they're really good with that or is it, you know, cause sometimes that's what I worry about is like, mm-hmm. is this really giving me a good, accurate reading? Mm-hmm. It can help, um, you know, obviously your body's symptoms and how you, f- how you feel are the most accurate, but the things on your watch or on your phones, they can kind of tell you how many times you're waking up in the night, for example. So if you find that you're waking up a lot during that first half of your sleep, then that's probably telling us that you're not getting the deep sleep the quality sleep that you need um so they can give us indicators but at the end of the day if you feel like you're rested you're not having any you know brain fog or like things like that um no like cravings for sugar um yeah then you're probably you know okay living your best life living the dream (laughs) what i'm hearing is if i go to bed earlier i'll look better naked Exactly, you okay. nailed it on the head, yeah. Dan. I, I That's motivating. I won't lie. I went bed. I went to bed the earliest I've gone to bed in last night for, and I don't know how long. And mm-hmm. I did. I woke up today feeling like a million bucks. So maybe, yeah, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe you're onto something, doctor. <laughs> you might be onto something. <laughs> yeah, research, research says. Like, <laughs> just reiterating here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's so important. I think we just get lost in in kind of times that we live in now. Um, obviously, okay. practicing safe, like sleep hygiene. That's huge. Pra- we don't listen to the sleep. sun anymore. Safe sleep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> that that's, gives us, gives us a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Mm. Now I feel sufficiently shamed. No, <laughs> not supposed to. Lifetime night owl over here. <laughs> yeah, my brother is too, and uh, he seems to be. Oh, okay, I mean, in, so. I'm, I'm in front of a computer, the blue light in my eyes all day, so <laughs> it makes it harder to wind down. Maybe because your eyes are blue, it reflects the blue back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's that, what that I'm is, seeing. That is a distinct possibility. Is that a, is that a blue, like a natural blue light filter, or does it actually like <laughs> Maybe optimize it and make research. it worse? So. <laughs> yeah, I'll check out some uh, some studies to see if uh, people with blue eyes have better sleep. <laughs> That'd be interesting. I mean, I've yeah. seen plenty of studies that say people with blue eyes are just better. Wow. In general. Um, well, and I'm pretty sure they're right. But please maybe. send me those. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Send us send us. Send what are that. your sources? <laughs> you can probably find an article on every co- eye Weber. color out there that says that you're better at something. And it's like probably on. Uh, what, are, what, are the, what are those nonsense like? Like a, articles a on Buzzfeed. Facebook. A BuzzFeed yeah, article yeah. where you're like. I'm trying top, to think of the other one. Top I, Vox. I can't remember the name. So or, it's, yeah. it's terrible radio. Top five <laughs> reasons why blue eyes are better for blue yeah, light yeah. consumption. <laughs> Reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're smarter. Why Why people that are late are more creative. Why pre- procrastinators are actually oh, better. Why, you, why just, being on time is better. All those. There's all those articles. You're just giving yourself like, excuses. Yeah. I'm trying to remember yeah. the, the name of that website. I like to read those articles and just think like. Yeah. This is just a manifestation the manifestation of the human psyche justifying all of yeah. our, ourselves. This is big yeah. justifications. <laughs> Sometimes you need a little shame in your life. That's what <laughs> we're I, not trying to shame. We're for. not trying to shame. <laughs> <laughs> we're no shaming. shade thrown here. <laughs> <We're shaming> here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so all, this actually is a good segue into um, your general philosophy of naturopathic medicine. I mean, it sounds like you start out by shaming people into the proper behaviors exactly you've got it <laughs> my patients never come back <laughs> no, they just they just listen <laughs> like yes so you use fear and negative emotion oh my goodness uh, manipulation um, 
<laughs> I hope they don't feel that way. <laughs> well, they're, they're going to be listening to this and start yeah. think, they're going to be like, I think you're I'm the wondering. nicest person I've ever met. So uh, everything I'm saying yeah. is a lie. I, no. I, we get a lot of laughs in our, in our um, appointments. And yeah, even like I had a family the other week and they brought their daughter and she's just like dancing in the appointment and she's just, like excited to share like what she's eating and things like that. So I think people do appreciate you spending the time to to pay attention to them and to you know like figure out and help not them understand them. not yeah. pigeonhole them personalization Personally, goes yeah. a long way yeah i think they really respect that and they enjoy having that kind of attention and um you know that kind of insight in their body because sometimes things happen and you're like why and and giving them that is, helps them with so you just approach everybody as an individual and um Try to connect to them on a personal level and yeah. then pragmatically, practically kind of problem solve. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can get like the beauty of naturopathic medicine. Again, it's kind of like an art. So you can get three different patients with the same diagnosis. So they can all have high blood pressure, for example. But the way you would uh, you would treat them would be completely different based on what they are like and what their lifestyle is like. Um, so it really doesn't make the job boring ever because you're always kind of figuring out creative ways to make things work for that person and i think that's what makes it so fun and so um so fulfilling for the patients too because they feel heard and they feel like what they're being told or what they're learning about in our our sessions is matching with their lifestyle and with what their values are what their goals are for life and and when you put that kind of anchor their health towards their goals it really helps them like work more vigorously towards that so. plus at this point they kind of feel like it might be their last stop like they've tried everything else so mm -hmm. you know you're showing them a, a different path in a different way hopefully and then mm -hmm. it does work obviously so yeah um that definitely i'm sure with that coupled with that personalization is is definitely um let's say something that keeps it positive for them mm -hmm. yeah i think you know the whole interaction it's it's very different and i think a little bit refreshing for the ones who have seen and gone through the system um to be looked at as a well-respected and an equal individual so you know yes we're you know medical practitioners and we have certain knowledge and expertise but at the end of the day you are the expert of your own body so we need to listen to you as well and learn from you as well and putting our two you know expertise together it really makes the plan work so mm -hmm. do you ever find that that sometimes that people don't know their own bodies though mm -hmm. yeah so you also get people who are you know kind of with looking for you just for guidance and wanting to be told what to do and of course you know some people are just not used to looking at their poo and examining <laughs> if it floats or if it sinks like most of us are not used to <laughs> I, didn't even, I didn't even know that that was a, like, there a thing there you go so <laughs> oh helping you become a little bit more aware i just assumed that that was just life i knew that, I knew that was an area of medicine <laughs> but the, the toilet just did it like i didn't know that there was floaters did that come from me stuff. wow <laughs> yeah so um did you nick i'm gonna blow your mind did you know there's poo transplants yes i did okay. know that i did know that no <laughs> i did know that that was a thing mm -hmm. and that's for the the bacteria yeah, yeah because that, some people's people with poo bacteria immune is issues a lot i think that go go that route yeah. well no it's not trans probably jeff bezos does too what's, just what's to, like, the, the like transfusion <laughs> optimizes right? performance I, I think it's called fecal transplant oh is it fecal? That's what it's yeah. called yeah. Yeah. okay yeah mm -hmm. yeah definitely a whole other <laughs> i'll believe the doctor yeah. <laughs> another day for another day another, wow. a whole other discussion on like the the bacteria <laughs> in our body and oh yeah. like that the too. microbiome is a big topic mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah but i'm asking my cliff notes yeah. understanding mm -hmm. of that is that we know nothing so leave you guys with that <laughs> <laughs> i still don't know what we're even talking about yeah it's, i'm still yeah. back at poop floating <laughs> and that being a difference yeah but go ahead please continue um no I, i'm just gonna i was just gonna finish uh your question there before we go into poop floats i know nothing um not you know nothing <laughs> we know nothing about the microbiome yeah as a, we're so as a species that. that's mm -hmm. what i'm saying <laughs> um, but I was, yeah, during our appointments, like we ask you so many questions and that kind of forces people to become more aware of their body. So you kind of learn that over time if you haven't been before. So, yeah, I never knew that just, that should be a thing. Just naming it can sometimes yeah. help 
people yeah. mm-hmm. or like even describing types aware. of pain you know like what kind of pain or like where do you feel it and if mm-hmm. it's anywhere else um some people don't even realize that they have pain somewhere and, mm. yeah <laughs> um but bacterias uh <laughs> They, yeah, that's a whole other subject that is really becoming so important in our understanding of health as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the bacteria that reside in us and that make up, you know, our vitamins in different parts of us, there's more of them in our body than there are of our own DNA, which Mm -hmm. is amazing. Like all of these things living with us, contributing to us. Um, influencing our mood, our our mind, our gut, like all these functions um, Mm -hmm. have such a good symbiotic role and we're just scratching the surface on understanding how. How are they doing this and what, you know, what ways can we optimize and let them thrive in us to work for us in the best possible way? I, uh, I I went on a path recently that was largely influenced by that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kind of changed my diet around based on self-diagnosis based on, you know, internet articles. Mm -hmm. uh, And it was actually peer-reviewed studies I was looking at. Mm -hmm. But I made a decision that I needed to kind of change the circumstances in my gut based on past surgeries, being on antibiotics multiple times, lactose intolerance issues and things like that. And kind of I made an educated guess that I had a certain type of bacteria Mm -hmm. overgrowth. Mm Mm-hmm that may have been contributing to brain fog and decided to try and eradicate it with my diet and how are you feeling the dietary intervention seemed to produce the response that i wanted whether it was the mechanism that i just described or just you know like coincidence Mm -hmm. i don't Mm -hmm. know but yeah it's an association but like there's so (laughs) many other things that again we said are in food that work together Mm -hmm. um so it's always kind of hard to say this is a direct result of this But I I do know that changing your diet will change at least the bacteria in your digestive system Mm -hmm. fairly rapidly, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Um, If you you eat a consistent new diet for a week, you're going to see changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. That's my understanding. It's amazing how quickly they adapt, how our body adapts. And even the conversation on sugar I have with my patients, um, a lot of people are addicted to sugar and they just, you know, they crave it all the time. And I tell them just don't eat sugar for a week and you'll notice how quickly your taste buds change. So you'll notice mm-hmm. you don't need as sweet of a, a food to stimulate it. Like you're like, when you eat again in a week's time, you're like, whoa, that was like really sweet. And so you can already like shift your body and like let it adapt to your new new lifestyle. Right. Having too much of a good thing in that sense. And then being, yeah, it's like uh, it dulls the senses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I probably, I would say two years ago, um, started reducing my sugar intake and then I did a mm-hmm. sugar detox. And ex- you're exactly right. Mm-hmm. Ten, uh 10 days with no sugar and I think seven days with no carbs Mm -hmm. cravings started to go away you know after I got done dreaming about ice cream and cakes for the first few days (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, I no longer needed it as much or wanted it as much and that's actually been fairly long lasting like I don't have as much of a sweet tooth anymore right right it's amazing at this point like if I just have some cream in my coffee I'm like wow this is sweet like (laughs) that's my treat like a dessert yeah Mm-hmm. So I, had a, I eat a fairly low carb diet now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are What are you thinking about, Nick? You look like you got a pondering pace. Well, I I guess for me, I, the way I want to go further with this conversation is to kind of get down to nutrition and fitness. Mm-hmm. And so, so number one and number four on this chart here. Yeah, eating. I don't want to. I don't want to skip this one. We're gonna get to this. <laughs> we'll, we'll breathe. Yeah. Yeah, we got we got eat, sleep, breathe, and move. We kind of talked about on the front page of your handout, but some maybe I guess some of the typical clients or typical fitness clients you might see, and they're coming in with various obviously various types of of questions or maybe types of ailments. Some I don't know. We'll, we'll start here. What, what are some, what are some of the typical things that, that they might see? So some of the or that you might see with people who are fitness related and you know coming to you for advice. Yep. So they are looking for ways to sleep better. Um, some of them are looking for basically like how to just optimize their like energy and their performance. So they want to know like what, like what, like usually a lot of them are pretty educated on the food, like the nutrition they have down. Your so athletes come in. Yeah. They probably know. Yeah. They know that. Some stuff. 
yeah um so just like a little bit of refining on that but there's a few good mushrooms i also love to mm. throw in and help with their um, stamina help with their energy and endurance um, so i usually uh, throw in some mushrooms for them to help with that especially when they're training or um, just had someone who's cli climbing uh, mount kilimanjaro today and so i gave him some herbs to help with you know with the oxygen saturation in his blood cells when you're doing uh, high altitudes and um, certain mushrooms to help with that too. So. None of the psychedelic ones. Say, Cause those are, are you into <laughs> microdosing? Because those are the good ones. <laughs> Let's not get my license suspended. No. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> None of that. Um. So she didn't not <laughs> say it. in Ontario yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Denver's, is it in Buffalo? Denver's the only snow. <laughs> no, it's not. But it's, it is <laughs> that, starting to become a thing in the States. Oh, Denver yeah? and uh, mm -hmm. LA. San Francisco. Or San Fran, yeah, one of the yeah, two. Yeah. Well, D Denver has, San Francisco's talking about it. Oh, mm -hmm. no way. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly enough. Yeah. yeah. So. And they're all coming. We're all going to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> yeah, no, mushrooms are like so powerful yeah, though. Yeah, uh, it's. <laughs> sure are. <laughs> It's really fascinating to we know to where Nick's going the, soon. <laughs> the DNA and the effects of mushrooms, and even the intelligence, like they talk to each other. Yeah. This is real, Nick. Okay, so, so how can <laughs> how can I? So me, I'm a picky eater. So you're gonna have to. Okay. Yeah. Well. So yeah. So let's like to... approach this like in your practice. Mm -hmm. What would be your approach? to the diet and nutrition with a patient and take an individual like Nick yeah, as an example. Let's, let's talk about me. Sure. <laughs> uh, I have bad genetics in, in some things. Let's see. But I'm trying to be an athlete. Mm -hmm. You are an athlete. I am an athlete. I, I try. Mm -hmm. And uh, say one of my biggest things is that I'm, I, I struggle Remember to... Remember what Dennis told you. You are an athlete. <laughs> That's right. I struggle to lose weight mm -hmm. because I also have a rare form of anemia. Thalassemia. Thalassemia minor. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I find like, you know, just stuff like that always tends to hinder. Even doesn't matter how many calories I eat or all that stuff. But so take me, for example, you know, what, how would you, you know, start with my process? Right. And your so. pickiness. And my, oh, and that I'm a picky eater. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I'm a very picky eater. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's the picky Italian in me. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of like breads, pastas. I love breads and pasta. That's uh -huh. what I had for lunch here. Thank you, <laughs> Pasca, whatever you were called. Pascateria, I think it was. I don't know. And then, uh, but yeah, I, but I try to limit it as best I can. Though the protein pasta, I was just telling Dan, mm -hmm. very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> All right. Um, so your main concerns are your energy levels and the weight that you're not able to to yeah to, to, to shake despite, off despite you know being so active and mm -hmm, exactly and tracking yeah. his calories. Yeah, I do track my calories as best as possible. Mm -hmm. And Which are overrated in my opinion. Mm -hmm. They are, and you I gotta don't think about the whole food like Tamara said. I would say that <laughs> I'm not as like Dan, where I'm I'm like anti carb. I just I try not to make it my whole day. Right. So I try to keep my carbs, you know, pretty low. But I also mm -hmm. try to make get as much protein as I can. Okay. To help fuel. Awesome. Yeah. So that's a really great insight that you have that protein is really crucial one um, to help build more muscle mass because you are working out a lot and inherently if you have more muscle you're burning more energy um, two protein is really useful for your liver um, so your liver is in charge of you know making a lot of hormones breaking down a lot of hormones um, you know it, it stores fat or it does not store fat so if our liver is functioning well uh, with enough protein and things like that then that will also help with weight loss um, so for me, I would start with looking at your hormones, to be honest. So looking at your cortisol levels um, would be really helpful here. Like, especially if people are finding that they're gaining weight more in their midsection. Mm. Um, true? Yeah, okay. yeah. That's where it only is, really. <laughs> yeah, so oftentimes uh, midsection, like weight gain, is from having high cortisol levels. And so cortisol is our fight or flight hormone. It's a stress hormone. And that's really predominant when you are running from a bear, like historically when you're like <laughs> trying to save your life, cortisol is going to shoot high. Um, it also goes high when you're starving or when things are not going well. Your body's in this survival mode and that's where cortisol is kind of kicking in. Um, it's so you're saying I am a bear too. <laughs> I love bears. <laughs> yeah. I'm bears a bear. Are so awesome, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so having a good like understanding. So if you are feeling like low energy in the morning um, and then really wired and tired at nighttime, that can kind of show us if your cortisol curve is kind of flipped. Um, so usually an ideal curve looks like high cortisol in the morning because that's a little bit of the energy that you use to wake out of bed naturally. And it kind of tapers off throughout the day and it's at its lowest point at nighttime. So you can fall asleep very easily because the cortisol is not stimulating you. Oftentimes I see a lot of people who are really fatigued in the morning and then really wired at night and they take a few hours to fall asleep at night. So their cortisol curve is kind of flipped backwards um, if you have sustained cortisol what that does is it tells your body to store fat hold on to the fat because we are in survival mode so if it depends on what stresses are going on in your life stress not just psychological like there might be like job related relationship you know whatever but it's also That's in terms track. of <laughs> also in terms of sleep so the quality of your sleep because your body if it's not getting that deep sleep, that's a stress because mm. it's constantly not healed. And when it's not healed, that damage accumulates and that's a stressor, um, you know, through inflammation and what, what have you. Um, so that's another big one for people. If they want to lose weight, you need to make sure you're getting that deep sleep that we talked about earlier as well. Right. Um, yeah. And then a third piece of the puzzle is helping your liver, like, support its function and breaking down and so giving it all the vitamins and minerals it needs to really work and break down the fat that's accumulating there um, because that's where a lot of the the weight gain happens if our cortisol is too high for too long. Yeah, so I'd probably look at that for you first. So there's like testing you can do, like a cortisol salivary test, and we take samples of your saliva three different points of the day and send it to a lab and it'll tell us what your cortisol levels or you can do a urinary test um, there's a few different options and so you can have a look and see what your body's doing mm. Mm -hmm. if some of those things resonated with you great bedside so. manner yeah it did it did no i i i definitely think you might be on something i mean i don't know i mean you're you're the doc i'm just you know i'm just <laughs> I, we're obviously not in the, <laughs> the whole setting, and I appreciate you trying uh, to understand me. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. We're here for you. <laughs> we're in this together, okay? Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I want to come to this breathe section here. I'm, and I'm interested and kind of fascinated by this. I don't hear a lot of people talking about this as an aspect of health. So what do you want people to, to think about when it comes to breathing? Mm -hmm. I mean, Sorry. oxygen would seem to be an important thing for a uh, human organism. So, <laughs> That's crazy, so. <laughs> uh, crazy. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I'm getting enough of it. Yeah. I, I, have sus I, have, I, I have suspected for a while that I might not get the oxygen that I should be getting. Why so. do you think that? Narrower airway, which I'm working on addressing. How do you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious. How do you know you have a narrow airway? Um, so a doctor told me one time oh, that okay. because of uh, uh, my overbite, mm -hmm. the, the lower jaw is kind of pressing back a little oh, bit. Okay. And I had a sleep study done mm -hmm. and they were like, uh, you're not quite, what's the what's the common uh, issue that people have when they sleep can't Sleep apnea. Yeah, sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. They're like, you, you don't quite have sleep apnea because the level to reach that is like a thousand if you're under mm -hmm. a thousand then you have apnea and if you're not then you don't and i was at like 994 or something they're okay. like yeah you're fine okay but i was like oh i'm fine but it doesn't sound optimal right right <laughs> and just yeah when i'm like run every time i've i was a runner in the past whenever i would mm -hmm. do distance running i would get gas so much faster than other people mm -hmm. uh, likewise but i also so i just you know yeah working i try to always be conscious of like trying to work on my breathing taking more deep breaths i take mm -hmm. a lot of deep breaths now that i'm thinking about it more but mm -hmm. hopefully when i with this uh you know you saw my invisalign here hopefully with <laughs> that kind of treatment it'll help actually make me just breathe more and more naturally but mm -hmm. and what to, yeah to, just to piggyback off of, be thinking about and doing yeah and to piggyback off of dan i've noticed so my nose is broken a hundred times oh yeah i have a deviated <laughs> yeah. septum as well so, so i only breathe out of one of my nose yes uh, you need help not, <laughs> so my my nose needs to be readjusted we both need nose surgery maybe yeah. get a two for one just yeah that'd be awesome <laughs> we'll we'll tell them we'll do it for the podcast <laughs> but i have noticed that yoga where i took a class where it was just for sleep it was like yoga nidra or something or something cool. like that and it was like all about you're focusing on your breathing and i was just like you know my nose just 
Because <laughs> if you see it, it's, it's real bad. Like it's <laughs> like it's over here. But anyways, um, but yeah, I think breathing uh, from you know, kind of piggyback off him, mm. finding different ways to breathe. Probably you, you, you. That might be one of the things you're talking about with this. Yeah. So well, starting with the importance of learning to breathe and breathe efficiently and effectively Uh, one you said like every cell in our body relies on oxygen to produce energy so that's a huge given why we need oxygen Um, the second one is breathing not just inhaling but the exhaling is one of our major routes of elimination so not Mm. only are we eliminating through our bowels and you know urine and things like that um, but exhalation all the carbon dioxide and the waste products that come out of our blood as well Mm. as gases need to be excreted through breath as well um, so having the breath, the inhale and the exhale are equally important. So people who are not paying attention, um, you know, you're not, you're not f- filling your body with like maximum potential of oxygen and, you know, energy basically. And exhaling, you're not letting go of all the waste and things like that too. So yeah. So some of the big things that we want to help people do is like get into the sensation of what full breaths feel like and so some of my sessions I spend time with patients or I do a free meditation class on Saturdays at the clinic and we just you know spend a little bit of time on moving and moving with our breath so when you come out into the world you're like oh yeah like this is how it feels because when someone tells you to breathe deeply you're like cool like what does that feel like and you're not used to that kind of thing but if you can kind of train your body over time to recognize the sensations like this is the sensation i'm looking for this is how my stomach feels when i'm you know taking a full inhale and so as we become more familiar with the physiology of our body and how that feels when we're taking a full complete breath um you know you can kind of bring that more and more into your daily life and that's just makes your body so much more efficient and more effective at processing all these you know reactions and and things like that um and you might have heard of the wim hof method it's pretty big Mm -hmm. as well so some people are using that kind of focus of like all right like breath is so important it helps you it can really push your body and like make our body do things that we you know might not realize it's capable of with you know saturating our blood with oxygen with energy um and maximizing its efficiency i tried it once I yeah. probably should do it more. It, it, felt, <laughs> it felt pretty good, actually. Yeah. yeah, what did you feel? Just a little bit more energized. I also had, like, a strange experience where I was getting, like, very tingly lim- limbs. Mm-hmm. And then my muscles started contra- to contract on their own. Oh. And I was, like, it was very uncomfortable for a little while, like, curled into a ball almost <laughs> <laughs> because of the pre- just deep breathing, like, rapidly for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. But then when it's like, when it went away, it was, like, I felt very good. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I was doing it right or anything, but it was just yeah, experimenting. Yeah, I've, I've been trying it as well on myself. And uh, yeah, the first few times I did hard. it, it was hard to It's like you hard know, work expand. to do it. Yeah, you're like pushing yourself to breathe. Yeah. And you're like, I can't take in this much air. But like as you do it, I felt tingly as well. My like my hands and my feet got a little sweaty. Like I, I could feel my body kind of getting really energized, like producing a lot of energy because heat mm. and things like that are Maybe from that's air. why I was contracting. It was like had all this energy and didn't know what to do with it yeah yeah you're turning into a superhero um <laughs> so basically you're becoming yeah. hero you're becoming fit, a hulk <laughs> you're becoming hero fit <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so it's definitely like playing around with our breath it's free it's completely free and it can like have That's such a crazy. huge <laughs> here i'll give you some <laughs> oh, they're gonna start wow. making us pay for that soon yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well do you remember um i think in china because when during the Olympics or whatever, they had really bad air, so they're oh, really? importing air from the Rocky Mountains or something <laughs> to China on like a dollar for Selling a bottle. It? That's amazing. <laughs> so you might have to buy some air, but uh, right now it's free, so take it. it. Yeah, selling ice to igloo. You know the igloos. I want to get an oxygen tank like the NFL players have on the yeah, sidelines. Yeah, get I oxygen po- tank. I want to get one of those for when I'm at the gym. How about just right now? <laughs> yeah. give me free air <laughs> <laughs> hmm. all right so i learned more about breathing yeah so we learned about some eating <laughs> we learned a little bit about sleeping especially in that first half which obviously i've been missing out on for a while now <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah. breathing and now let's yeah get my eight hours but it's not always it's starting at 10 mm-hmm. so so we're moving <sighs> moving yes yeah um you know we've we know a little bit about that yeah you guys are pretty well versed and you guys are moving all the time yeah 
things. That's but true. you, so you obviously know well, the importance. Not all of the it. time. We have desk jobs, but <laughs> yeah. you're actually sitting at the desk we were just at for the last seven hours. Eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice space, though. I like a lot of you know places well, for you guys to do handstands. It's free. And, yeah. <laughs> now that we should have been doing handstands. Yeah, we don't we don't own it, but it's free. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome in here. Yeah. Let's we're not at, tell everybody where it is because it might get yeah, locked. No, but <laughs> shouldn't give it away. Yeah, no free handouts on no. this place. <laughs> <laughs> they make enough money <laughs> but it's in toronto so go ahead you can guess yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. good luck um, so you guys obviously know the benefits of like athleticism and movement in terms of like your health cardiovascular etc but um where i want to really emphasize for you here is like a lot of the blue zones that they studied um, i'm mm-hmm. not sure if you've heard of them i have it's where, yeah it's where people are most commonly living, living to the centurions and nice yeah nice like 90s old age and and living good well. quality of life yeah. yeah so the ideal goal like we know it can happen our human bodies can be built and sustain like a quality long life and in a allegedly. lot of allegedly <laughs> allegedly let's go let's go visit them um <laughs> yeah so in these areas a lot of the common themes are movement and it's not just exercise like in in western mentality we think okay we got to go to the gym we got to do some sports or like things like that which is so important and awesome to do but it's the movement that's incorporated in your daily life daily life activities so how often you know you're walking around in the city and usually if you live in a more urban area you get more opportunity to walk because you're not just driving all the time so setting up where you live or like picking a place when you have an opportunity where you want to be around um Mm-hmm. All of these things are really important to consider in terms of movement. You know, how far away is the closest grocery store? Is it going to make, is it inclining or is it good for you to like walk or do you need to take some kind of public transport or car? Like thinking about all this, like it's really important to plan in terms of that. Um, taking the stairs, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah. When I relocate, mm-hmm. the next time I relocate, I've been thinking like that guy. And I heavily make my decision based on walkability. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's kind of fun to be like walking out and about with your community as well, mm-hmm. which is another big factor I think that contributes to such a good quality of life for these people is that they are part of something. And I they have. Say, yeah, if we're talking about blue zones, we need to add a fifth box here for community. socialization, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I don't know if I added, I can't remember. Oh, <laughs> is it in here inside? Yeah, it might be. It's, it's in not, there. It's yeah, soon. it's it's in <laughs> yeah. one of the panels there. But it's just talking about you know like learning from your community and being a mm-hmm. contributing member, and um, that also like helps so much with your well being and sense of purpose. Um, and eating with people. So they said more than half of our meals in America now are eaten alone, right? And so that's just what we have. We've set up our society to kind of be like this, but it doesn't need to Single be Single like tier. It goes against, <laughs> goes against evolution uh, if you believe yeah, like, in such a thing. You know, making a simple <laughs> meal and sharing it with your friends is like such a joyous thing. And it actually takes, um, it, you know, it brings you a lot of physiological benefits and mental benefits as well. So it's like to remember connecting with these parts and it doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't need to make like a six course meal or three course meal. You can just put together your favorite like we're not on doctor money, so <laughs> I can just I can just fry up some steaks. Fry up yeah. some steaks, That's throw about, in some <laughs> if you want to put some greens by that maybe. Um or not. <laughs> I'll have a garden outside. They can pick stuff. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> like just having people over Pipe and dreams. like <laughs> sitting down in a place like, okay, like you're focusing on the food now, not just like reading emails and eating and wondering where your food went after. That's all. Just being this like. food that I didn't have to like do anything for. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it kind of makes it special and it makes it feel good. It makes, you know, the connection with food again. Forage. Strong. Forage. Yeah. It's part of foraging the community eating together learning together um really like understanding deeply again like how we're connected to the food and to our people and how important those are for us so i have a uh yeah i have a i have a it might be an off-topic question i'm i don't think so this this was submitted by uh, a listener who's familiar with your work it says uh <laughs> What is the Chinese who. medicine approach to nutrition? <laughs> um, so I've heard about you utilizing like chi, yin and yang in 
in some of your practice or philosophy, perhaps, mm -hmm. if that's true, what, what does that mean and how do you apply it? Yeah, so part of our training is learning some traditional Chinese medicine. So um, that's a field that's been practiced for about 5,000 years. And um, it's kind of fun to bring in an Eastern perspective to food as well. So mm -hmm. um, I think what the listener is talking about is certain foods, for example, are like more warming to the body, more nourishing to the body, and some are more cooling for the body. So, for example, if you get like cystic acne um, in Chinese medicine, that's a sign of a lot of heat and dampness accumulating, and that's what you get, like the whiteheads and like all that fun stuff. Um, <laughs> so fun. Yeah, so uh, foods... Dr. Pimple Popper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So foods that are hot, if you can imagine, are obviously like deep fried foods for one. Um, but it can also be things in Chinese medicine they classify uh, like mangoes, um, you know, like certain red meats. Like red meats are also kind of heating to your body and it also depends on how you cook them. So if you have cystic acne, you want to have more cooling foods, things that are like more vegetable based like cucumbers or salads. And even if you steam them, they're cooling. You don't want to deep fry them because that will just bring them into the to the heat zone right mm. what about um, dried mangoes dried mangoes are because they're so high in sugar so sugar in chinese medicine is an inflammatory or heat based mm. food so that will still be a hot promoting does heat always mean inflammatory heat does not always all right yeah yeah because when you said meat i was like that doesn't to me that's not inflammatory for my body no, yeah it depends like it depends on what kind of meat and like how you're cooking the meat for yeah. sure so like um fish so everything in in chinese medicine is on a scale of like yin and yang so mm -hmm. relative to each other so um so if, like meat like steak would be more yang than a bok choy for example mm -hmm. but then if you have um things like steak and a fish like the fish will be the yin like and mm. the steak will be the yang so it, it kind of it's all relative to each other and um yeah so there's definitely like really good properties of meats as well there's a lot of nutrition benefits it's a lot of it's nourishing a lot of meat things meats and legumes are very nourishing in chinese medicine um so people who feel very weak very deficient and tired they want to have more nourishing kinds of food so that you can get that from your meats you can get that from legumes you can get that from like sweet potatoes um and more like kind of substance foods I'm just know? waiting to hear about dense. Yeah. Dense foods. Yeah, that's a good outside one. of steak and some legumes i'm waiting to hear about things i might actually eat so yeah what do you like to eat like <laughs> i think nick needs to eat some liver actually <laughs> Ugh, no thank you i'd rather not. Butter makes it better. Dense food i'd rather animal. go look and see if my poop's floating or not <laughs> eat liver jeez <laughs> yeah um yeah, so I don't know what foods you don't like or... <laughs> the list is long. Yeah? What foods do you like? Do I like? Yeah. yeah. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> cauliflower crust. Yeah, cauliflower. Mm. No, I I have been trying to to, to open it up. Um, yeah. I would say mostly right now my diet consists of... Uh, I'll try to do like low-fat beef mm -hmm. in certain meals, chicken whether that be rotisserie and I'll just take it right off the bone and mm -hmm. chop it up or um, I'll make chicken breasts, low fat chicken breasts. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to be a little bit, that's where my, most of my proteins come from is the meats. Mm -hmm. And then I try to do like peppers mm -hmm. and I don't like onions mm -hmm. and I'll do broccoli and cauliflower and I'll do uh, carrots and some beans, different types of beans and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, Sounds pretty yummy. Yeah, I know. So a lot of it, there's a lot of things there. Is edible? Where do you get your fats from, typically? If you're eating low-fat meat and, uh, you know, you're talking about veggies and hot sauce and all these different do things. Do you eat, like, put oils on your veggies? Or only a little bit of olive oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not only, but not necessarily the veggies, more for when I'm cooking the meats. Okay. I'll put some olive oils, like the, mm -hmm. you know, to keep it so it doesn't stick to the pan. Yeah. Um, but it's the organic olive oil. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where I get a lot of my fat from. I, I, it's a good question. I'm curious because mm -hmm. healthy fats, in my opinion, are part of a balance, a good mm -hmm. diet. Olive oil good for your is hormones. great. Yeah, yeah um, and you might want to use for like if you're heating foods, um, like coconut oil, grapeseed oil, avocado oil. Oils that have a higher like heating point are mm. safer to cook with because olive oil's 
pretty low. You don't want to heat it too high. It gets destroyed by high heat, right? It'll go rancid. So it damages the oil and it kind of makes it more inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory. So there's certain oils that you want to, you know, save for salads or like drizzle over the food after you finish cooking it um, versus, you know, cooking it directly on a heat source. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've been cooking with ghee lately. Yeah. Clarified butter. High smoke point. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and put olive oil on top of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I didn't know that. Yeah, I really don't care for olive oil <laughs> either way. <laughs> so I was just using it to use it as a cook, you know. And my that. favorite olive oil is butter. There's a butter flavored olive oil really? from uh, yeah from no a place way. in Buffalo called Davolio. Yeah, they sell legit like real olive oil, so it's not that huh. you know, supermarket stuff. Cool. Um, Probably cheap. somehow they put like a flavoring in it, make it taste like butter. Amazing. Great. Yeah. They also have like garlic and. Tuscan herbs and all these other ones. Yeah. Uh, butter is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cheese. Cheese is probably where I get my fat from. Mm-hmm. If I had to think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I love cheese. Yeah. Do you eat like nuts and seeds or avocados? or? I don't like avocados, but I do eat like pistachios or mm-hmm. peanuts and stuff like that. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Some good fats in there too. Yeah. Walnuts, shape of your brain. Yeah, that's Good for your brain. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's, I've mm-hmm. always been fascinated by that, yeah. that concept of uh, like the foods that look like <laughs> certain organs like yeah. help them. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I got something to chew on. All right, there, literally and figuratively. <laughs> 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 we're gonna have to go. We're gonna get you some new cooking oils, I guess. Yeah. So I, I have another another question for you here. So, and this relates to like a lot of the questions that that we get. And that these could end up being some hot takes from you, but. Uh, what are your thoughts on some of these current dietary trends? So um, I'll start with the f- first one that's on this list is vegan or vegetarian. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people going that route. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially for fitness. Mm-hmm. Thoughts on that approach? What maybe considerations people might have to think about if they're going to go mm-hmm, for that sure. route? Um, I, I personally like experimented a lot with that and I follow... Like, Sounds like it. Yeah. yeah, a plant-based diet as well. So... There are definitely things you want to consider, um, you know, in terms of like certain vitamins, like your B vitamins, your omega-3s, yeah. your iron, um, those things you need to be conscious of. And sometimes you may want to supplement those. So um, speaking with your doctor or naturopath about like a good quality supplement is is going to be helpful if you're choosing to do that route. Um, at the end of the day, though, there is really no one diet, I will say, that fits everybody, to be honest. Like, there's a lot of benefits in different aspects of so, each one. I would assume you'd say kind of the same thing about paleo, keto, mm-hmm. uh, carnivore, intermittent fasting. These are some yeah, of yeah. So, what buzzwords um, out there right now? <laughs> if, if you, you guys see, like, you've seen the new Canada's food guide, which is, um, you know, evidence based. Is that what this is? That's what that is there. Okay. So, you can see, um, really, like, an optimal diet is having a good proportion of your food from vegetables and fruits and, mm-hmm. like, proteins from, you know, certain meats, fishes, and occasional red meat. Um, and, like, plant based proteins are becoming also, like, you know, valued as well as bringing a lot of nutritional um, benefits to people Um, and then you've got some healthy fats so ideally i think a a diet that focus on whole focuses on whole foods less on processed foods Um, if you're cooking more like whether it's keto paleo like honestly like cooking at home making your own meals and eating with people that's going to be the healthiest thing for you, whether you choose to. And of course, listening yeah. to your body at the same time. Because right. some people thrive off keto diets, off paleo diets, because of certain food sensitivities they have or how their body is just structured. There's different compositions that they have. Neurochemistry too. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, one diet may work really well for somebody and not so well for another person. So at the end of the day, it's becoming a, like a master in your kitchen and figuring it out. It's going to take a little bit of time. And I know that's not what people like to hear all the time. <laughs> Because they want to have, oh, this diet is going to be the best. Well, everyone everybody. wants it. Is there like a genetic or evolutionary component to that? To... Or to the fact that, you know, different things are going to work for different people? Is that what it comes down to? Well, you kind of see some trends with like lactose, for example, like in Asians and African societies, like they have a higher level of lactose intolerance. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, like grains and certain things, like most people can tolerate things like that so i, I haven't so it's seen on an individual basis it's more, more of an so individual than, like, mm-hmm. you know uh, 
yeah, if I have yeah. Eskimo lineage and I need to eat more yeah, whale blubber. Yeah, but like genetically, we <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> genetically, like we've had a pretty diverse diet. And if you think of a forager, they had to have a diverse diet. Some days they had to eat just meat, raw meat or whatever they could kill. And the other days they were digging for roots and they just ate root vegetables. So like our diets are able to, you know, kind of mm -hmm. handle all of these different uh, sources. We're very flexible. Very unique flexible. animals. Flexitarians. <laughs> Is what we can call ourselves. Is that a thing? I didn't know that. Was <laughs> I was reading in, I think, the Wall Street Journal today about flexitarians. So, <laughs> well, so I, I, mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of interesting too, because is that, I mean, is that a good thing then to, because we're coming from these different types of lineages, and and so is it tough to then figure out where? So it kind of, I guess, in the end, I, I guess what I'm asking is, it still boils down to genetics. In a lot of ways, yeah, your diet genetics. can still boil down to your genetics. Well, your your lifestyle also impacts what your genes do. You mm -hmm. the things that you eat, the, the decisions you make, the experiences you have turn on and off different genes, right? Yeah. So it's very complicated. Yeah, I would recommend a book called The Lucky Years. It's um, kind of gives us like like a a good insight on like how far genes can take us and how like genetic medicine is going to like interpret all that but there's limitations to that of course because a lot of it is also the environment and how we turn on and off certain genes um so we can rely on gen genes and that kind of theory for so much but it's not going to be consistent and reliable and different for genes person. interplay with each other in different ways too and it's just so hard yeah like you, you don't have it's supposed to be doing yeah we just don't have the sophistication and technology to do, like understand how they play in such a complex system in our bodies i'm gonna, I'm gonna read that while i poop yeah it's, it's a really really great <laughs> but bringing book. it back to cooking mm -hmm. so I, I think that's probably a good point to emphasize again for people um eating out is is definitely not great even if you think like well this is like what i might have cooked at home anyway mm -hmm. what you don't realize is perhaps all the, the plastic particles that might be in that mm -hmm. food um the types of oils perhaps even rancid oils or inappropriate cooking oils that were used mm -hmm. um, to prepare that dish versus doing it yourself mm -hmm. um, and also even just the macros perhaps not being the way that maybe you would do it if you did it on your own. Mm -hmm. So what, what are, I mean, I made it just list, list some of the things I think about, but are, what are the other advantages to cooking versus eating out? Yeah, like you can, you know, sometimes if you eat out and you're like, oh, wait, like that's it? Like that's it, all the broccoli I got? Like, you know, when you are cooking mm -hmm. at home, you can really tailor like, oh, I want some of this flavor with this today. And you can season it and like, you know, spice it, add herbs or um, you just like really create like something that's like so palatable and so yummy for you at home. Um, eating out is, you know, it's still great like to do once in a while with your friends or when you're for a special occasion, what have you. Um, but it's, it's got its limitations in the sense that it kind of removes us from being happy in the kitchen, being comfortable in the kitchen and just like relying on someone else doing the work for us because the work for your health like it comes from you like that everything that you choose to do um is gonna influence your body and influence your body when you're 80 and like what you can do in in that time and it's a little hard for us to think in that term like far far in the distant future but imagining yourself like dan surfing you know, if you're going to be a, an awesome surfer and like you want to make sure your body's optimized for that, like it's all the steps that we do today that are going to help. And, you know, reminding yourself, keeping your picture, that if logo I'm, yeah, If I'm going to retire to the beach and be a surfer when I'm 50, I got to be in mm -hmm. tip top shape. Yeah, exactly. So um, eating out is great, but there's just so many things that you don't know what they're putting in or how they're cooking it with. Um that may not be so great, but there's definitely restaurants out there who are focused on giving you clean, um, healthy foods, and they're very conscious of how they prepare. Um, yeah, but so find those places. Find those places, and you know, try to go out and ha like when do you, you know do know any of those places. Um, there's a few like that I really love. Um, Away Kitchen Cafe in Toronto. They make a lot of really great foods there in house. Um, really, you know, simple but delicious. What else do I really love? Oh, Veggie Delight. I know it's a lot of veggie ones, but um, yeah, that's fine. Peter he makes a really great like Caribbean kind of style, and you see him cooking in the pots in the kitchen, like right in the front there. So yeah, man, it just yeah, <laughs> it's it's so delicious, and it's it's kind of 
really homey and cozy that way. So mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. And then at your place. And then at my place, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my friends aren't complaining anymore, so I think it's safe. <laughs> if they're still alive. They're, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and she's, once again, not denying it. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shotgun questions, my favorite section. <laughs> my, one of my favorite portions. Oh, wait, wait, how did we transition into this? Shotgun questions. <laughs> no, I don't know. We don't, <laughs> we don't transition. We, we just do it. Magic editing <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up <laughs> with some shotgun questions. Perfect. Have you listened to the podcast before? I did yesterday on my bike ride home from work. Oh, nice. Did you? Yeah, Which one did you listen to? I listened to the one you guys did with uh, Powerlifter. I can't remember what her name Ricky. was. Ricky. Or Monica. Or Monica. Or Monica, I think that one. Oh, okay. Cool. Shorter yeah. one? I didn't like, see what her Was it an hour or was it a half hour? It was a half hour one. Yeah. Okay. Seven minutes. Dr. So Dr. Monica, Monica Hart. Yeah. Yeah. We recorded here in Toronto. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> dun, dun. She's pretty cool. Yes, yeah, she mm-hmm. was. Great guest. Friend of the show. <laughs> shotgun questions so you you might have heard some mm-hmm. I don't but we're gonna give you two were. we're gonna hit you up with them <laughs> anyways yeah. all right first question is what is your favorite cheat meal my favorite <laughs> cheat meal and you can't say i don't believe in cheat meals it's a cop out <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness um this is so no you can if you want to but oh my gosh <laughs> like i love dark chocolate eating a lot of dark chocolate but cheat meal I would say probably going to Saigon Lotus um, and having a big bowl of curry noodles with like sweet potatoes and taro and things like that. Oh, that's so like, okay. There's so many things I love to eat though. Mm. <laughs> this is a difficult question. It is. I mean, for me, it's chocolate based sweets. Yeah, I love like ice cream. just eating chocolate. Um, <laughs> and Chocolate's I can't. Po- it's. it's- <laughs> I mean, I would say that's one of the more unique answers we've had. Really? Yeah. Most you people say either pizza. Pizza is the top, top vote. Yeah, pizza has so definitely far. been the top one. And because yeah. everyone loves buffalo pizza. So. Right. Um, <laughs> but no. I, joking your egos. <laughs> I would say pizza has probably been the number one. Mm-hmm. And then ice cream was another unique answer. Yeah. That's been my favorite answer. So That's far. Dan's yeah. favorite answer. So chocolate's yeah. probably Dan's second favorite answer because yeah. it's not Honestly. pizza. <laughs> yeah, I love chocolate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Second question. I'm going to tailor this to you mm-hmm. probably in two parts because you don't, I mean, you, you might exercise, so we know that, and we know we'll, we'll touch on what I think was lighter on. All right, never mind. So anyways, <laughs> favorite nutritional item. So that could be a herb. <laughs> that could be a, I don't know, anything. A utensil. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever you feel. The, you, you, What's this, your favorite thing that helps you in the kitchen? Yeah. How about, okay, yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. Um, there's a few things. So a herb box. We have a giant one that grows like dill, thyme, like basils of different oh, varieties. So you're, so you're growing your own herbs? Yeah, we have our own herbs. And like that's just the most like i feel so gourmet sometimes when i just like pick a few and i put it on my food or like i start cooking with it and it tastes good it smells good so that's what i love makes things fun makes things fun it makes you feel like you're like a real cook so i love using that Mm -hmm. what was you gonna be your part two part two of this part two is i guess for me for as far as nutrition goes you know your favorite thing that you've ever learned about nutrition I just learned poop float, so and why <laughs> that could be based off your nutrition. I'm gonna, not gonna let this go. I can't. So I can't. To really throw me for a loop. Now that that's a thing for me, what's your like? You know, along those lines. My like favorite thing about my well, body. What or like just, what? No, like made you have like a perhaps a change of perspective if you had one, or like a breakthrough moment maybe. Mm, with food. Not yeah. When, doesn't have to be with food exactly. No, it could be anything about your your life, like uh, nutrition wise, or being the you know becoming a doctor, anything along those lines. Hmm. Maybe okay. I think it'd be breaking, um, learning to bake my own sourdough bread. Um, I nice. started doing that last year, and that's also kind of a cheat meal. Like I could eat so much bread, and <laughs> and I know that's not so good for me but when you make it at home like learning how to train a starter is the best healthiest bread you can have yeah yeah it's just like literally just flour and water 
um, and you train like this healthy culture of bacteria. And mm -hmm. like I failed so many times when I first started. Um, my starter just like smelled so bad. It smelled like nail polish sometimes. And I'm just like, <laughs> this isn't working. But like over time, like I persisted and learned to make sourdough bread and like fold the dough and work with like different consistencies and like see the result and like sometimes it came out so flat and like dense but it still tasted good and now like that it's like shaping up better um that's really given me a, an appreciation for like the process of like real cooking and i think that kind of rounds out like all the things i'm talking about like yes it, like i love you making simple meals and like doing this but at the end of the day like knowing that you created something like and you put so much love and attention and care into something and then you share it with people like they really appreciate that and it feels really good to to nourish people with good like real good food yeah so i love that good answer. nailed it <laughs> i knew i could count on you to redeem me <laughs> it was horrible <laughs> No, because you know, but we, right. no, he made good. that up on good. the flags. We, we usually did. have a different question here. Yeah, it's <laughs> tough because these questions don't necessarily relate to your background. I see. So it was a good question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. So if you could change one thing about your, you know, career, uh, we'll just say overall career. What would it be? I would set up my clinic differently. So ideally, I want to have like the bottom floor of my clinic to be. A restaurant where I get to Ooh. cook lots of cool foods and you bring people in um, and they go up to the second floor and they see you and whatever you like recommend <laughs> things right and you do your that thing that sounds fun and All then right. this, we're gonna get some VCs back this up <laughs> yeah lure them in with yeah. the food yeah. I don't feel like this has to be a, a regret this could be like a right now yeah <laughs> like yeah so just building that so they like see okay everything we talked about it's like here and you can see the food you can see the garden you can like experience what it what we're talking about in the, the appointment you know it's not unattainable so and then you write someone a prescription and they go downstairs and fill it yeah your food <laughs> <laughs> one-stop shop yeah <laughs> i'm all aboard I yeah that's what i would change <laughs> sam go yeah. downstairs and get some go get it yeah <laughs> i am all aboard this. imagine that this, like this, a whole new type of pharmacy this kind of doubles <laughs> up on this other answer which is what's next for you we just found out yeah <laughs> <laughs> clinic dreams, clinic yeah. goals. Don't threaten um, us with a good time. <laughs> yeah, so um, working on developing this forager message a bit more. So um, before I, you know, open that clinic style up, um, <laughs> I'm going to be starting to cook at our clinic. Just we have a little kitchen space there and holding some demos there, um, and nice. then maybe opening up like a different, like renting out a kitchen space in another Toronto. industrial place. So yeah, we've got I, it all going on here. <laughs> yeah, plus kite surfing. Kite surfing. That is another dream to be able to practice naturopathic medicine by day and kite surf the rest of the day and night. <laughs> um, just it's a worthy goal. Yeah, just to live like the winds off of Lake Erie. I don't know if they're strong enough. <laughs> There's like certain spots you have to like drive. Yeah. To um, <laughs> and I don't really want to do it in a wetsuit. Kind of want to just like. Well, you can always bring it with you. Yeah. <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts on sunlight? Sunlight yeah. uh, feels really great on your body, and it gives you <laughs> nice right. color. <laughs> I needed I needed to ask this question. I don't think that's what Dan can you wanted. Tell by my skin color? Yeah. No, that's that's kind of what I wanted. Okay, good. I mean, mm -hmm. Do we need to avoid the sun at all costs? Do we need to Do we need to get some sun at all costs? Mm -hmm. You know. I just gave you two extremes, but yeah. Um, so definitely, like I, everything. I got too much sun. Maybe so maybe I you're like, this isn't my yeah. wheelhouse. I don't want to talk about sun. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, <laughs> but like, you're making me think of the beach. I'm thinking about how much I love sun. Yeah, like sun is awesome. Sun is the source of all life. You know, I agree. It's like, it's honestly you like, put sun next to breathing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go outside. That's part of sleep, actually. Oh. Um, sunlight it really helps, helps regulate, regulate yeah. your hormones and your your sleeping sleep patterns. Sleep better in the summer. Exactly, um, but sunlight is energy for everything, and we go up the food chain, and we're getting mm -hmm. our energy from inherent sunlight from plants and little bacteria and plankton. Don't um, overdo it, but get some sunlight. That's kind of what sunlight. I've been trying to. Yeah, and preach. always wear protection, like when you're going out for long periods of time. Um, I don't know. Safe sun. <laughs> safe sun. Safe sun. Practice safe safe sleep. sun. Yeah, practice safe sleep. <laughs> safe All right. sleep. All right, last question. <laughs> yeah, last question. I, any, give you the floor. Uh, yeah. Any pro tips that you want to impart upon our audience? Sleep at 10 a.m. It will optimize 
10 everything. PM. Oh, we sorry. Try to do okay, that over. Right. Yeah. Sleep at 10 p.m. because it's going to optimize like every part of your health. If you are taking supplements, if you're taking different like things for your health, whatever mm-hmm. you're doing for your health during the day is not going to have a standing effect if you're not sleeping at night. So sleep is so so important, and it's been underrated for way too long. So, yeah, 10 and, p.m. And cook real food, right? And cook real food. I'm gonna yeah. try the sleep thing. Yeah, we'll and it's also free. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm gonna do some sleeping tonight. <laughs> you just my, you just blow my mind. <laughs> something I'm gonna implement right away. Girl, you crazy. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> you know how we do. <laughs> well, now you do. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on to the yes, show. Thank you. Mm, thank you for having me. It's definitely been a pleasure, and uh, I like I said, fountain of information, and and we're definitely. Uh, I think there was a lot of great tips that you've given our audience and to everybody to you know maybe to work on including myself mm-hmm. so um and if, if any of our listeners liked any of those amazing tips they should probably send this episode to somebody yeah share it with a friend share it with anybody just all, uh, please share and then, it. then then subscribe because you don't want to miss great content like this no you don't this is ultimate you know you can live a better life type content mm-hmm Thank you for listening to the Hero Fit Podcast with Nick and Dan. Once again, yes, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Hit subscribe, whether you're listening to it on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever the like. Leave us a review, please. Rate and review anywhere you can. And this your advertising skills on our behalf. Yes, please. And share it with really everybody. It. Really it. Share it. For share. And yeah, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, keep it classy. This has been another episode of the Hero Fit Podcast, making humans great again, one podcast at a time.